is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Fire and Hemlock by Diana Wynne Jones, sponsored by Patricia Bing Grant. In these chapters, man, I didn't expect this book to be so emotional for me, but the descriptions of what's going on in Polly's home life are heartbreaking. Also, that horse was definitely magic, right? Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha, and this episode I'm covering chapters uh, four and five, um, which was uh, roughly 50 pages on my Kindle. Um, And these are some emotional sort of setup chapters. I really just wasn't ready, as I said. The fourth chapter starts off with uh, Polly wondering what the hell has happened to her father. And thinking that her mother just either forgot to tell her that he died or maybe just doesn't want to tell her, but he's been gone long enough that she knows now that he's not on a course, as she puts it. Um, The reason she thought this was that Ivy's mood seemed to be over and she was behaving the way she always did, but Polly could tell it was a disguise to cover the mood still going on underneath. So that's like the setup for this chapter. And then we get a letter that comes from Mr. Lynn in response to the letter that Polly sent at the end of the last chapter. And he wants her to come over for tea to his apartment in London. And Ivy, I don't think would have agreed to go except that she's going to be going to London anyway. And here goes the most, like this was the start of me feeling like, um, I guess not really starting to feel this way, but I had forgotten or at least hoped that Ivy was the way that she is with Polly. And I thought maybe the author was just going to set that up so that we knew that last chapter and then not necessarily hammer it home and revisit it again. And I was wrong about that because that's a lot of these two chapters. Um, Ivy says... I have to go to town anyway to see this lawyer I was told about. I was going to dump you at Nina's, but I think people are beginning to think you live there. If this Mr. Lynn really wants you, I could dump you there instead. Like, really? I could dump you there. Cool. Thanks, Mom. And then her mother just keeps on telling her to not let him spoil her. Don't be a pest. Over and over and over again. Which, like... Maybe Polly can be a pest in the same sense that like any child could be a pest, but she seems like a remarkably self-contained child. And the fact that her mother keeps telling her this and making her afraid, it's not even that it really works. She doesn't become afraid or self-conscious, but a different type of personality might. And it's just upsetting to like read this over and over again. Um, Meanwhile, as they head to London, Polly just keeps checking over her shoulder. She's really concerned that either Seb or his father or Laurel is following them. And when they get to the front step um, of his apartment, she's about to like mention something about them being followed and decides not to for some reason. And I think that's going to come into play later because it specifically said that the uh, she knew somehow not to talk about them. She didn't know how. But she did. Um, So I feel like that might be important, not talking about them out in front of his place. Not sure. Um, So at first, her visit with Mr. Lin is uh, rather uneventful. They hang out, toast bread and, uh, you know, snack. And he talks about books and lets her play whatever records she wants so that she can get to know music and find out whether she likes it. Um, And they discuss the make-believe that they have created. And he really wants a lot more detail than she originally was going to put in. 
which I really enjoy that like she started this thing, but then the fact that he presses the issue for certain things, she gets a little irritated and defensive. And finally, like initially thinks I, I believe that he's messing with her and then starts to realize that he's very sincere. It's just that he takes a different tack in terms of setting this whole world up that they're building. And these details are like really important to him. Whereas for her, this isn't the part that she thinks about, which I like because that's really how people are. We all take very different interests in certain parts of stories. For example, those of you who listen to other shows that I do know that I'm very into logistics, which is why I loved books like Jurassic Park or like the show Westworld, because you get to find out a lot about the like functionality of how some bizarre things work. Same with Dresden Files. Um, I don't always require that, but it is the part that I like kind of get hung up on and want to know more about. So that's, you know, how Mr. Lin is. It might just be part of growing up, too, wanting to know about that. Um, so he asks, can I switch straight to Tan Cool or not? And Tan Cool is his, like, hero name. She says, yes, I think so. But it's not that simple. Mr. Piper is you, too. But I don't have to rush to what sits on the water and begin each job from there, do I? No, and neither do I, said Polly. That's a relief, said Mr. Lynn. Even so, think how awkward it will be if the call comes while I'm in the middle of a concert or you're doing an exam. How do the calls come, by the way? Polly began to feel a bit put upon. Things just happen that need us, she said. I think, like the giant. You hear crashing and you run there. And he asks where he should keep his axe and she's like, obviously your cello case, dumb dumb. Um, and... When she, when he says, like, well, I guess I can get a special, like, compartment made in my cello case to put the axe in, th it's followed by this paragraph. It was odd, Polly thought then, and later, and nine years after that, remembering it all. She never could completely tell how seriously Mr. Lynn took the hero business. Sometimes, like then, he seemed to be laughing at them both. At other times, like immediately after that, he was far more serious about it than Polly was. So the fact that this paragraph specifically mentions nine years after that leads me to believe that the opening of this book where Polly is looking at the fire and hemlock photo and thinking about how it doesn't look the way that it used to look is nine years later. Um, it's That seems like longer than I expected, but... I could be wrong and it's not that far beyond and the nine years that's mentioned here is going to come up in the story at a later date because I don't feel like that's an arbitrary number. I feel like that's specifically going to be something that plays into the story at a certain point, which I didn't expect there to be a time jump. So I find that interesting. Um, so then we have the um, meet up with the horse he he's asking her, first of all, about whether or not he has a horse at his apartment. And she says, yeah, and I think it's going to be like that one and points out the painting on the wall of a Chinese horse that's looking rather fierce. And he's like, oh, come on, it kicks and bites, obviously. I'm not sure I can manage it. And she's like, well, you're going to have to figure it out. And this is the moment where he realizes what time it is and that he has to bring Polly over to the address that she memorized, which is the lawyer's address and meet up with her mom. And they head out there and they are interrupted by a weird racket in the street. And we find out later, supposedly that this horse escaped from some handlers in they, they notice a circus once this is all over. And he thinks that's where the horse came from was that somebody had it in a stable at the circus. Um, and the handlers who catch up with it say that some kid lit off a firework in its stall, which is messed up. Don't do that kind of thing, kids. They're lucky they didn't get trampled to death. And this horse is out of control. It's in the middle of the street. It crashed into a car and there's like headlights broken. Um, and Polly had flattered herself a little bit that she was going to be a badass right away if anything came up. But when this horse starts to go bananas, 
she actually panics, crouches, puts her arms over her head and like screams and waits for it to stop, which she is totally disgusted by. And I can sympathize because there's nothing more disappointing than realizing in a moment of emergency that you could not handle it. And I think that's something that we all really are not honest with ourselves about. Maybe some of us tend to be more self-aware and honest, but a lot of us, we see videos of things going on or we hear stories and we're like, well, I would have X, Y, Z. Would you though? Would you have? I bet you wouldn't. So this moment is just a real shame uh, that she winds up struggling a lot in the next chapter to overcome and and make sure that this is the last time this ever happens. Meanwhile, Mr. Lin hands her his glasses and takes care of this horse. And like, it is a lot of swearing. It's a lot more like physical, I think, than anything she's ever seen him do. And everybody's sort of assuming that it's his horse, the guy who owns the car that the horse crashed into initially begins yelling at Mr. Lin about how you should keep your horse off the street, to which Mr. Lin's like, hey, motherfucker, this isn't my horse. And it says he swears. I'm guessing he doesn't call him a motherfucker, but he may, maybe son of a bitch, something like that. Because the driver comes up to Polly later and is like, he doesn't need to talk to me like that. Why do you call me that? Um, And once he gets a handle on this horse, they're like other people have started to gather around and they all assume this is his horse. So it's a uh, really like, it feels like a moment that would be set up in their story where this wild horse comes out of nowhere and he is the only one who's able to tame it. Um, and I like this description. The horse stood still at last, orange flecked with detergent stuff swishing its tail the orange is its uh hair i was gonna say fur but i guess it's hair um because this horse is like an orangey color which i feel like is what they said the chinese horse looked like also and flecked with detergent stuff is obviously like you know when horses begin to foam when they're really worked up um but calling it detergent stuff is so funny to me um so this scene ends with Polly like kind of in a bad mood because she did not do how well she had hoped, but also it very surprised and impressed by how Mr. Lynn handled it. And uh, his glasses are so like greased up because she was holding them in her hand that after this like heroic showing where he handles himself far better than probably even he expected, he can't even walk to the address by himself, she has to lead him around like garbage cans and phone poles and stuff because he can't see at all. So that's interesting that he didn't seem to mind not having his glasses on when he was dealing with the horse. And when she asks him how he could see it, he said something like, well, it was pretty hard to miss something of that size. But I feel like this means something. The fact that he took the glasses off and seemed not to notice and managed this thing. Mm, Maybe he transformed for a second here. I'm just really interested in this whole deal. Um, So once they finally get back to the car where her mother is waiting for her, she doesn't even like ask to talk to Mr. Lynn. She doesn't ask how Polly's day was. I got to say, like, and again, this is so well written that it's (sighs) unfortunately Ivy's state was a silent one. Polly was dying to tell her all about tea and Mr. Lynn's flat and above all about the horse. But Ivy sat fenced in silence as thick as barbed wire and Polly knew better than to try and break in. The train was so crowded that Polly had to perch on mum's knee and Ivy's mood made that knee stiff and uncomfortable. Guys, it's so rare that neglect is written about in books with the same gravity as like physical and mental abuse, but I'm getting like emotional just reading that out loud. There is something so upsetting about that. Her mother just could not give a shit. Later on when they get home after 
ranting and raving at her in a far too open way about her father. Then she asks, well, you're not hungry, are you, right? Like, she can't be bothered to feed her fucking child. And Polly, not wanting to be a bother, is like, no, I'm fine. Because she doesn't want to, like... <sighs> this just... I did not have... I wasn't treated this way, but it's close enough that it really bothered me to read. How Polly is so aware of her mother's moods and that her mother is so unaware of Polly that she underestimates her kid so deeply and doesn't know her at all. And Polly knows way too much about her mother and her mother's relationship with her father. Like the way that her mother talks to her is this is somebody who needs a friend and needs to go and have an adult conversation with a fellow adult. Instead, she's dumping all of this onto her daughter, her child. Like this isn't a teenage daughter. This is a little girl. This is madness. This woman is being so uh, inconsiderate isn't even the word I want to use. So thoughtless about how this is going to affect her daughter because this is her father, somebody that she loves that you're talking about in this way, expecting her to somehow like take your side on faith as if she doesn't know better. That's part of what rang really true to me is that you can see how much her mother assumes Polly is on her side. And it's so obvious to me that Polly's just trying to like, let her run out of steam doesn't necessarily take her side because she's very aware of her mother's flaws. But that doesn't occur to Ivy because she again, underestimates what Polly understands and, and can see. So this was just really tough for me. Like, I just felt really emotional about it. Um, and her just getting far too into the details of her marriage and the things that she, um, the arguments that she has had in the past. And then flat out tells Polly about the fact that he's having an affair and that it's not the first time. Um, it's just, it's tough, man. It really is. Um, and Polly asks, if, is he with Joanna Renton now? Yes, Ivy said. She sounded tired. She too looked at the clock. Oh, is that the time? Are you hungry at all, Polly? No, Polly said considerately, though she was rather. I had a big tea. Good, said Ivy. I haven't got the energy to think of food somehow. Ugh. And then she says, you hop along to bed, Polly, and remember when you get married not to make the mistakes I did. I don't think I will get married, Polly said as she stood up. I'm going to train to be a hero instead. But she could tell her mother was not listening. Guys, this is tough. I just didn't expect this to hit me like this. There's something about that, you know? Whew. So yeah, that's the end of chapter four bummer um oh patricia's here hi patricia uh she says i'm sorry don't say don't you're, don't apologize it's really good like i really like this book um and like i said writing about neglect is not something that is done by a lot of authors it's often um a much more obvious type of abuse that I feel like is easier for audiences to categorize and firmly place parents in the bad guy uh, camp. And this is just so much more nuanced because obviously her mother isn't a bad person, but she is incredibly self-absorbed. And it's really like, it's the kind of thing where she's blaming her husband up and down for their marriage problems saying how much she slaved away. And it's like, 
I'm not entirely sure that I believe you, lady. Doesn't seem like you have a real clear vision of what's going on here. Um, so yeah, this is just, it's really well done. It's just tough. And I also like it because it gives you a little bit more, like, you know how this can be in ki in kids' adventure books where you're just like, where are the parents? And you keep on having to, like, the author will contrive these situations where the parents don't notice things or the parents see something differently than the kids do or don't see because they are adults and kids see it different. Like, this is just outright explaining where are the parents? They're not there. That's where the parents are. That's why she can run around and do whatever because her parents don't notice. And, oh man. So chapter five, dad came back two days later. Oh brother, this chapter starting like that. I was just like, are you shitting me? Like, that's my favorite moment when you're reading and you just your mouth drops open as you're staring at the page like what because I just wasn't expecting that. Of course you're not, you know, and I, I think neither was Polly. And uh, the instant that he walks in, it's a fight and the her parents are literally pulling her back and forth and shoving her between the two of them, trying to use her like a pawn. And in the middle of it, Granny shows up and Granny is a not here for this shit. I appreciate that once she's talking to Polly alone at her house, she's like, maybe I spoiled the shit out of your father. Like this could partially be on me, but he didn't ask her to come. She came because he called her telling her a little bit of what was going on. And she is a woman with some common sense who knows the situation and realizes that Polly is in like the worst possible position and that she's going to go and rescue her granddaughter and um, this in particular. So, you know, talking about neglect, I don't feel that I was neglected. I feel like uh, my parents did not know me and to a degree still do not know me. And that my mother in particular needed to have more adult relationships in her life and loaded a lot of her baggage onto me because I was the one that was there. But I didn't feel like I just straight up wasn't cared for. Um, I got out lucky on that. My fiance, on the other hand, he was neglected to a degree that his little sister almost died and was taken away from his parents and adopted by an aunt and uncle. And he almost was taken away, but just before some church members called CPS on his parents, his grandparents stepped in and took him in instead. And his parents lived like five blocks from his grandparents as he grew up and never came to see him and never showed up to like events or anything. So as we get into this next chapter, there is a scene where she hasn't combed her hair or bathed in God knows how long. And that is more the situation that he was in. He was going to school dirty. He wasn't taught to brush his teeth. So he like to this day, he has to deal with problems from that. Um, he was wearing clothes that he hadn't changed in like four or five days. So he stank like the kind of, of neglect that is comes off you in waves and people know. And the fact that it gets to the state that it does and Ivy blames Polly for it. She's a fucking child. You psychopath. What is the matter with you? Like I can't with this bitch. I swear to God. I know I was just saying like that. She's not a bad person, but maybe she's a little bit of a bad person. Maybe I take it back. Um, so Polly, um, she is writing this long letter to Mr. Lynn about Tan Cool and his three friends, because she sees three figures in the fire and hemlock 
photograph that she feels like makes it look like whoever's there has some backup. And also there's a little figure that she draws when she's painting at the table and later on in the, in the photograph, she feels like she can see a little figure off to the side. So I feel like somehow she's influencing this photo. I'm just, it's all very opaque at the moment. Um, at the end of the week, Granny took Polly home with her paintings, cards, and letter in a new folder. Mum seemed glad to see her. She hugged Polly and told Granny she was grateful. But Dad was gone. His hi-fi had gone too, and an armchair, and a number of smaller things from around the house. The divorce was definite. Definite, said Ivy, when Polly asked. In a way, it made home as peaceful as Granny's house. <laughs> Polly winds up getting really caught up in rehearsing for the school play and forgets to send her letter to Mr. Lynn. And there's a scene where she is rehearsing the play or no, she's doing the actual play, not rehearsing it, which makes it so much funnier, actually, where she and Nina are talking to each other on stage between like saying their lines, which I'm dying to know what that looked like from the audience. Apparently nobody noticed, or at least Polly's super self-absorbed mother didn't notice, but Nina's being pretty nosy about her parents splitting up and Polly gets irritated by it. And overall feels a little more irritated with Nina in general than she has before. Um, and pushes about your dad's girlfriend doesn't want him to see you, does she? Which I'm not entirely sure is true or if it is that Polly would even know that. I don't know where Nina's getting that, but something I, I'm just wondering where that came from. And then my mom says divorce marks you for life. Nina persisted. Do you feel very different? And Polly's like, holy shit, you need to stop. Um, so afterwards, Polly asks her mom, why did dad even come? I wish he hadn't. He was bored. I saw him yawning. To which her mother says, so was I bored. I didn't see why I should be the only one. That play has not changed one word since you started at that school. And before that, I was the angel Gabriel in it myself. I could almost scream by now. This was one of the queer things about divorce, which Polly could not have described to Nina, the way mum said this kind of thing to her that she would normally have said to dad instead. And the way dad was not really gone. He was not there, but he hovered in the background all the time. Polly wished she would go right away and get it over with. Whew, that is a word right there. Like her mother just saying that shit to her, which is super hurtful. Like, oh, I was super bored and I hated it and I had to go. And I told him he had to go because I didn't want to suffer alone. Wow. Way to be a shitty mom. And then ending it with how her dad is like around and she wishes he would just get lost. There was a long period in my life where my parents were talking about divorce and they didn't go through with it. And I was just like, oh, my God, just fucking do it. Like I was really in this place where I could not handle how wishy-washy they were being around it. And I was like, obviously you guys are not right for each other. You've already mentioned to me that you're thinking about it, which doesn't feel like a smart thing to do if you're not going to just do it. So do it already. But they didn't until I went, was in college. Um, so yeah, this, this like, just, just leave if you're going to leave. Like, girl, I feel you on that. Um, so they go to Christmas and in true to form, Ivy does not know anything about her daughter or what she wants. Polly's big present was a doll's house from dad. He must have forgotten she had one already. Polly tried to be brave. She had wanted a fort and some tanks and guns. She smiled. So right here, she thinks it's her dad's fault. And assumes he just doesn't know because he's not home. But then I told him that was what you needed. Ivy said, collecting wrappers. I hope you like it. So her mother who lives with her, who should know, told him what to get and was dead wrong. Polly smiled until her face ached and slowly unwrapped the last parcel. She was lucky to get anything from dad. Auntie Maud had told her so. She did not want to be ungrateful. 
Yup. That that whole bit right there. Yup. A shower of paperback books fell out of the parcel. With them was a badly typed note. You've probably read all these already. If you have, throw them away. They were the things they told me in the bookshop that nobody should grow up without reading. Merry Christmas, TGL. They were from Mr. Lynn. The smile on Polly's face became real. She sorted through the books. The only one she had even heard of was The Wizard of Oz. There were 11 others. Polly hovered a moment between five children and it, and the one most enticingly called The Treasure Seekers, and then picked up at random The Wolves of Willoughby Chase. Guys, I have read all of these, and I had an aunt who worked at a fine bookshop when I was little, and she would send me packages with books, gorgeous, illustrated, hardback, classic books, and I could not get enough of them. And so, like, I just can't emphasize enough how much every beat of this whole set of chapters just rang so close to home. Um, And, like, Wolves of Willoughby Chase, that was, like, top five favorite books of all time from when I was a child. Like, I really need to put that on the book club list for childhood favorites because I can't, like, that was top of the list. I would actually go outside and play alone that I was in that story. So she basically locks herself away from her family reading and Ivy's saying it's no good speaking to Polly when she's reading Maud. She's deaf and blind. Red used to, Reg used to stop her. You let her be. And I'm like, yeah, well, it's, it must be really nice for you, Ivy, that your daughter just like immerses herself in books so that you don't need to deal with her. huh? Um, so Polly goes like realizes that she sent Mr. Lynn a Christmas card, but never sent him the uh, letter that she had written him. And she goes back and takes a look at it. And after reading all of these awesome books that he sent her, it just doesn't really seem like enough. So she gets to work and like really goes to town writing a bunch more detail about their story, telling him about the divorce and Nina um, and there's just, you know, just this whole like life story mixed with the fast, the like uh, fanciful stuff that the two of them have been working on together. So then we have when school started, Polly began training seriously to be a hero. It was not easy and it caused a number of upheavals. The first was with Nina. Nina might have been good at ranting and pretending, but she was not athletic. She ran out of puff after uh, after once around the playground. When she found Polly had joined the athletics club, she was horrified. What do you want to do that for? She said. Polly had not been so pleased with Nina since the Christmas play. To train my muscles, she said coldly. Then stop, said Nina, or I won't be your friend anymore. All right, don't be, said Polly. It gave her a savage free feeling to say it and then turn away, leaving Nina gaping. She made friends with the two girls who were good at running instead. Nine years later, Polly could not even remember their names, but she remembered very clearly how annoyed she was with her muscles. I love this whole thing. So Polly just decides, like, first of all, I need to get fit. But second of all, I lost my nerve completely in the face of that horse that was rampaging around. So I'm going to need to figure out a way to, like, deal with adrenaline and get that pumping and, you know, become braver and learn how to cope with fear, which is pretty rad, to be honest. Like, she basically, what she wants is boot camp, you know, and I just sort of adore that she's so into that as such a little girl. Um, And I like the detail, too, that um, there's a moment where she asks some boys if she can play football with them at lunchtime. And it's not written that they were like, no, a girl, no, you can't play with us. It says they were surprised, but they agreed quite politely. And once Polly had got the rules straight, she proved to be a fast runner and a ferocious tackler, and they let her go on. Her knees were perpetually skinned and gray, and the roots of her dark of her hair grew dark with mud from heading the ball. That was my first clue. I was like, your, your roots of your hair should not grow dark, like... That shouldn't happen. You just wash the mud out. 
And I, so I like got a little wrapped up in that. And I was like, what? And then we find out later exactly what. Her only worry was that she enjoyed it so much. She was not sure it counted as training. Um, but it was a peculiar thing to do. Mira Anderton, the huge girl who was the school bully, took to standing beside the game and jeering at Polly. So Polly decides to use Mira as her like training buddy, an inadvertent training buddy. And she is going to fight Mira because of Mira making fun of her, but then realizes that heroes don't defend themselves. They defend other people. And Mira's just teasing her. She's not like getting physical with her. So there's not particular justification in her mind. So she just sort of waits knowing that Mira is going to do some shit, which she does. She uh, starts pulling some kid's hair on the way home. Um, and Polly gets into it. Um, the truth was that Mira was so astonished that a peaceful girl like Polly should suddenly go for her that she gave up almost without a fight. The little kid ran away. Mira went over backward into a puddle, and the only thing she managed to do to Polly was give her an accidental slap in the face as she fell. Polly's nose wept some drops of liquid. She wiped it off and looked at it as she walked away. It looked like blood to her, but it could have been adrenaline, and she was on the whole pleased at the way her training was coming on. However, Mira decides to get back at Polly. So what she does is picks a fight by going after Nina. And she seriously, like, she's grabbing Nina and, like, bashing her the back of her head into the asphalt, which is fucked up. Like, Jesus. And Polly saves Nina, but Mira is ready for her. You know, like, so they both get fucked up and Polly totally holds her own. But it's not that Polly doesn't get away almost unscathed the way that she did the first time. In fact, she winds up with two black eyes, which is pretty rough. Um, but she does, she tears off Mira's skirt and makes her nose bleed. Um, and of course, there's like a couple things happening here. The first being that Mira is a bully, so she's expert at turning things around and making it seem like she's the victim and that Polly came after her, which the teachers are believing at this point because Polly's parents are going through a divorce, which I'm sure everybody knows because it seems like a fairly small community. And I think this is what the teachers believe is causing Polly to quote act out. I think they, and, and you know what? That may be part of it. We're seeing a lot of this from Polly's point of view, and she seems to be, you know, she does not, that doesn't even occur to her. But as a grown up, you can look at this and be like, yeah, that could be part of what's happening here. Um, but also, adults are just super bad at spotting bullies, I feel like. Like, I don't know. It's just a frustrating thing. Um, but in the end, she goes home with a letter from the headmistress um, telling her mother what's been going on, that she's been acting up. And Polly has to go home with her two black eyes and the letter from her headmistress and explain to her mother what happened. And her mother's like really upset and says something like, what have you done now? As if Polly gets into trouble all the time when she doesn't. And Polly is startled to find out that the rest of the school is like rooting for her and thinks of her as a hero because she stood up to this girl. So she said, uh, it says people asked for her autograph and wanted to be her friend. She came out of school at the end of the afternoon, surrounded by a mob of people all trying to talk to her at once. So Polly is like, simultaneously it's a good thing for her because she's able to be distracted by it and not dwell so much on what's going on at home, but it isn't making her happy having all these friends. Like Nina had been her best friend and they are not anymore. Um, she goes over to Nina's house after the fight and because Nina like is so grateful to her. Um, but she feels bored by it and just doesn't connect with Nina the way that she had before. And this is just, uh, this was a really interesting thing to me because, you know, 
the whole idea of standing up to the school bully and the rest of the school, like, loving you and you being really popular and everyone, like, vying for your friendship. That's like the fantasy that a lot of kids have about what they want in, in you know, in their little social circles. And Polly is getting that exact thing to an even greater degree than I think is realistic. And yet it's doing nothing for her in terms of like fulfilling her. Um, so, yeah, this is just a really interesting little sidestepping of the expectations that I would have of a story about a child this age. Um, and Ivy, when she's talking about the uh, like she gets home and she has the letter from the headmistress and Mr. Lynn is on the TV and he I don't remember where they say he is, um, but he is not in the country. So she realizes that he hasn't gotten her letter and she's wants to watch it. And she reaches off to turn Ivy reaches to turn it off. And Polly says, don't turn it off yet. Ivy looked at her in surprise, but it's nothing interesting. She turned back and switched the set off. Like lady, holy shit. All she wants is for you to not turn the TV off. What is wrong with you? Jesus Christ. Give your child something. Um, and then I'm not having this from you. You're just like your father. He'll make up a lie and then he'll make himself believe it. I've watched him do it and I'm not having you grow up that way. I want the truth. What was that fight about? And when she just says Nina was being bullied by somebody and beat up, then her mother is like, oh, well, all right, I'll go talk to the headmistress. Um, so, yeah. This is another advantage was that Polly did not have time to be as miserable as she knew she felt underneath. Ivy seemed to be trying to pull herself together. She surprised Polly by getting a job in the office of Middleton Hospital. Polly had to come in and get her own tea and do the shopping on Saturdays. Polly quite enjoyed that, though the house seemed very quiet. Like, it's one thing to be a latchkey kid that comes home and makes your own snacks. That is many kids' experiences that our parents aren't home when we get home from school. And, you know, if you don't have a stay-at-home parent, that's just how it is. And I don't feel like that's such a hardship. But going and doing the shopping, that's next level. That's different. That's, you know, mm. um, so just before school broke up for Easter, a puffy brown bag of a parcel arrived for Polly. And, it's a note from uh, Mr. Lynn and some little uh, plastic toy soldiers because she wrote to him about how she had wanted the fort and the soldiers and got this dollhouse instead. And he asks if he can see her the first week of April because um, he's going to be back in the country and she has school break at that point. So that's perfect for her. So she's uh, writing back and then goes and tries on her best dress, which is what she wore last time she went to see him. And there's still stains on it. There was a grease stain in front where she had dripped butter and honey despite all her care, and a muddy patch on the back where she had crouched on the pavement, afraid of the horse. The dress did not seem as big as it had been. So her mother takes home her daughter in a dress that's got stains on it, does not wash the dress, and isn't even aware that it doesn't fit her daughter anymore. Like, this is basic childcare shit. Wash your kids' clothes. Wash your kids. So she calls up her grandmother, really upset, because this thing is, like, just ridiculous looking now. And her grandmother is like, I'll take you out and I'll get you some stuff. It's going to be your birthday present, though. To which Polly is like, that's fine. And she wants to get a new dress initially. And Granny says something about, well, wouldn't you rather like jeans and like a nice jacket? And she's like, actually, yeah, that would be better. Um, I just love her Granny. Thank God. Like grandparents, they can go either way. They can do too much. But in the case of this Grammy and uh, Owens as well, like, thank God for them. I don't know what would happen otherwise. Um, and so when... Ivy comes home. She says, Mom, my hair needs washing. I suppose it does, Ivy agreed. Neither of them could remember when Polly's hair was last washed. They went up to the bathroom where they both had rather a shock. 
Polly's hair hung in snakes because each piece was matted into itself into a sort of rope, and Polly had head lice. Ivy had to go out for a special shampoo and a fine-tooth comb, but the comb would not go through Polly's hair. Don't you ever brush your hair, Ivy said, grimly dragging an ordinary comb through it. (sighs) Girl, really? How do you not notice this happening? What is... I know I keep harping on this, but seriously. Um, And so she wants to just cut it off rather than take the time to comb it out. And Polly is not having it. And her mother says, after all I've done for you, and I love that Polly says, you haven't done anything for me. You let me get lice. And I was like, bitch. They shouted at one another for quite a while. At length, Ivy gave in. You always did have such a will, Polly. (sighs) Bitch, I can't with you. I don't know how she even... Somebody needs to take this child away from her. Um, It took two hours to get Polly's hair combed and another hour of washing after that. The water that came out of her hair was dark brown for the first two washes. Ivy washed it again and combed it. Knits floated in the wash basin and had to be rinsed away. Let this be a lesson to you, Ivy said at last. Yes, Polly sighed. (sighs) Guys, I hate her so much. Let this be a lesson to you. You know what? Yeah, it is a lesson to me that you don't give a shit and I can't rely on you. And I know that you won't be there for me and that you will blame me for shit that is your responsibility. That's the lesson. Thanks. Mm. This is really rough. Um, so that is the end of chapter five. So that was like, you know. That was the what we had set up this time. And um, I guess the next chapter is going to be her meeting up with Mr. Lynn in April. But these like, and again, I know I keep talking about how rough this was, but I want to emphasize that I really do enjoy it. Like, it's just, she really gets to the heart of the matter. Um, oh, Abby says her, uh, Diana Wynne Jones' own parents were incredibly neglectful. So she knew. Oh, brother. That makes sense why she's doing it so well. That sucks. But as Patricia points out, as a kid, it made me feel seen. There has got to be a lot of kids that go through this kind of thing, you know? So thank God somebody's writing about it in a way that feels true and real. Because it can, like, for me as a child, I wondered a lot if I was expecting too much. Do you know what I mean? Like that seeing my friends who were really like ever they were taken care of in every little way. I almost thought of them as the ones that were like, uh, like weird and being pampered or not even pampered, but just like coddled to a degree that would make them weak. And It took me a long time to realize that, like, the fact that I was left to my own devices and had to do so much of my own care, starting from a pretty young age, and that a lot of, like, emotional baggage was put on me, wasn't normal. But it took a long time to, like, realize that and understand that. Um, So, yeah, like, just really well done. Um. Is there anything that y'all want to ask me before I uh, wrap this one up? I'm going to be doing in just a few minutes the next uh, five chapters of Iron Druid, if you guys are interested in joining me for that, which is really fun. It's definitely a little bit of an upbeat in comparison. Um, So it was a nice pair to do this afternoon. And then this evening at, I believe, 5 p.m., I'm going to be doing the next um, 50 pages or so of Sunshine by Robin McKinley. So, all right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate the commission. And um, I believe, Patricia, that you commissioned the next 50 pages as well, if I'm not mistaken, already. So that's awesome. I'm definitely going to go and sit down and read that as soon as I can, because I really want to know what the hell's going on with Mr. Lynn and this whole, like, photograph. I There's something about this photograph, and I can't figure it out. It's all so vague at this point that it could really be any number of things. 
And I'm also unclear on whether like Mr. Lynn knows or understands or has any idea what could be happening with Polly. And I don't know. There's just, there's something happening there. So, um, all right guys, well, I'm going to sign off and I will see you in like five minutes to start iron druid. So if you can make it, I'll see you then. Thank you all so much for listening. Toodaloo motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.